Nicola, uh, you've been working you know, on the issue of uh, sustainability and social impact for a very long time. You, know, uh, you were also part of the process contributing towards the whole establishment of the S SDGs. Um, how, from your perspective, how has the global picture via V sustainability SDG, do you see that it has changed um, since your time there? And, you know, I, we would love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you, TJ, for your question. Um, look, I, I, yes, it has changed uh, in a very big way, um, as already, by the way, mentioned by, by previous uh, colleagues. Um, as you mentioned, I, I was incredibly lucky to be uh, working as head of policy at the, at the United Nations in New York uh, when we were drafting uh, or helping to member countries to draft the, the sustainable development goals. So it's been very interesting to see how things have, have evolved since then. Um, I have to say that when the SDGs uh, came together, I, I personally did not think that they would become so prominent, so well known around the world that there would be so much discussion about the sustainable goals. Uh, I personally actually thought that the agenda that we had put together was perhaps too complex, too complicated. You know, when you compare it with the previous Millennium Development Goals, that they were much less, less complex. But the reality is that I was wrong. Uh, sustainability has become a big, big trend. Um, I think that we can see uh, the growth the, in importance of sustainability uh, in different ways. I would say certainly we see it very clearly in the corporate world, as it has been mentioned already by the first speaker. We also see, we see corporates more and more uh, trying to define their sustainability strategy and trying to go beyond the classic CSR sort of tick the box approaches. We see a very clear trend in the world of finance and investing companies. When we look at the, you know, the rise of responsible investment, ESG investing and all that, it's absolutely huge. Uh, we see it, of course, with the now growth in terms of quantity and quality of social enterprises. So companies that place at the very heart of their mission, uh, the idea of sustainability and, and societal impact. Um, so this growth, I think, is, is clearly now accelerated, well, on the one end, by a long-term phenomenon, which basically it, it the, 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 uh, the arrival of a new generation of, of consumers, of investors, or employees, younger people that are much more aware of uh, societal issues. And also, I would say this old trend definitely accelerated by the pandemic, uh, which I think brings about a a sense of urgency around sustainability uh, from all of us. Uh, so big, uh, big rise in sustainability. At the same time, what I would like to highlight is that, and perhaps this is the less rosy part of the picture, is that there is also with it a big rise in greenwashing, in calling sustainable what is not sustainable. Um, I use a lot now this term rainbow washing. So when you look at all the the colors of the SDGs. And I have to say that I see some of the best companies putting those SDGs on their website and the strategies, but I also see some of the worst companies sticking SDGs logos everywhere. So the risk of rainbow washing or green washing is real. Um, and so what I, perhaps what I would say here is that the rise is there, and, but I would dare to say that this is perhaps no longer the time to celebrate sustainability, but perhaps to protect the integrity of the concept. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, interesting. I have learned something new today, rainbow washing. You know, um, I was actually going to say, we do see quite a lot of um, the pictograms and the tech lines being used by many companies these days. Yeah, so it's uh, something for us to think about, I think, especially for the business people. Uh, but yes, definitely it's time to protect the integrity of the SDGs. We were talking a little bit earlier about, I guess, you know, um, 
with Ayako Sun private public partnerships. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, you know, how, how can policymakers um, support the development of sustainable and inclusive businesses? And also, you know, uh, we would want to hear from you what trends, developments have you been observing across this region? Nicola? Yes, thank you. Uh, complex question, but uh, let me let me try. <laughs> um, there is indeed uh, obviously a role for policymakers, for governments to uh, support and to accelerate uh, a transition towards sustainability and in particular to encourage sustainable businesses, social enterprises. Um, I think that they, there are at least four things that, that uh, policymakers, governments could do. The, the first has to do, and I would like to refer in particular to social enterprises, which are a very important and in my view, still relatively neglected um, part of this landscape and neglected by governments and, and policymakers. First, defining, helping to define legally even what social enterprises are. Helping to define as precisely as possible what do we mean by sustainability? What do we mean by sustainable? So there is an effort, obviously, that is going on in some countries, but that needs to accelerate in terms of clarity as to what are we talking about? Well, what can be defined as social enterprise? What can be defined as sustainable business? So this has to do with legislation. It has to do also with, in my view, with a certain control over certifications, because we see now the abundance and emergence of all sorts of certifications around sustainability. Um, the second one, in my view, has to do with taxation. Uh, governments, and, and I am aware this is a very complex area, but governments need to go uh, further in uh, fundamentally giving an advantage to sustainable businesses, to social enterprises. Uh, what I find incredible uh, still is that in most countries, certainly in Asia, but this applies for instance to Europe as well. In most countries, if you are a young person and you start a social enterprise, so you are really contributing to, you know, to, to, to progress, to, to uh, tackle a development challenge, you are treated pretty much in the same way than a normal or even a bad business. You don't really have much advantage. So we need to find a way, and I guess taxation should be one, to give a clear advantage to uh, social enterprises. I make one example that I, I discussed just uh, this morning. I was in Bangkok. In the same street, I had a very big, very uh, famous uh, co uh, you know, coffee shop chain that starts with S and ends with bucks. And, uh, and then there was, uh, very close to it, there is a fantastic cafe that provides training opportunity with, uh, to youth with autism. I think that if I enter in the second one, I should perhaps not pay the TVA on my coffee. And perhaps I should pay it in the first one. Just making an example. Uh, the third point has, has to do with infrastructure. Uh, I think that especially the smallest uh, sustainable businesses, social enterprises sometimes struggle with that. I think that very concretely, not only national governments, but perhaps municipal governments could offer co-working spaces, incubators, and things like that to these kind of businesses. Uh, last but not least, fourth point uh, has to do with investment. Um, in my view, policymakers have the means today to put together investment vehicles or grant facilities that basically can support financially uh, businesses that, uh, that deserve uh, that support. Um, I, I, I have to say that these are still very early days, both across the ASEAN region and across other geographies on all of these issues. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, the UK and the US are examples of countries that are still leading in these areas across in particular the, the four areas that I mentioned, but there is innovation popping up, popping up pretty much everywhere, including in the ASEAN region, for instance, in, in Singapore. I think that there are many very interesting examples. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much.
Yeah, I, I do agree. I guess, you know, un, until such time where um, the legal definition can be more robust, the probably the probable challenge is really then how do you how do you tackle taxation? How do you tackle all the grants and the funding? Yeah, because then you have many people that will start to put themselves into that definition if it's too loosely bound, you know, but um, very important thoughts though. So thank you so much for sharing that.